Hello Internet and welcome to Financial Journey, a channel dedicated to all things personal finance. My name is Alex and I'm back again to bring you more of the financial education that I never received growing up. Today we're going to take a deep dive into credit scores. Although there has been some talk recently of revamping the system, as of today, we're still stuck with the three major credit bureaus calculating your credit score. So it is important to understand what they are, how they're calculated, and how just a little knowledge can save you thousands. Before we jump in, I've got to ask, please give this video a like as it really will help out the channel. At its core, a credit score is a metric of how reliable a person is at managing and paying off debt. This can be payments of consumer debt, credit card debt, mortgage payments, car loans, student loans, and so on. For lenders, this value is generally considered as an indicator of the risk that they are undertaking when lending a person money. The higher the credit score, the more consistently the borrower has historically paid at least the minimum payments for bills on time, the less absolute debt they have relative to their income, the less they use the current credit limits they may have, and the less they are seeking debt. The lower the risk the lender is taking on, the lower the rate of interest they can offer to the borrower as the likelihood they will default decreases. So in the interest of saving money, let's talk about credit scores. What factors go into calculating your credit score and how long both positive and negative features impact your score. There are three main credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Lenders will report to these bureaus usually on a monthly basis. And you are entitled to a free report from each one once a year. Although there are a variety of credit score algorithms, for most lenders, and this is particularly true of mortgage lenders, your FICO score is the primary report that will be checked when being considered for a loan. Unfortunately, the exact calculation that goes into the score is an incredibly well-kept secret. I don't know why, but we do know that it is usually scored on a scale of 300 to 850, with higher scores suggesting lower risk for lenders. The general considerations that go into calculating a credit score is as follows. As you can see, the largest contributor to your credit score at 35% is your payment history. This will capture not only on-time payments, but will be deleteriously influenced by payments that are greater than 30, 60, or 90 days past due. This section will also be affected if a payment goes to collections, is charged off, or a person goes bankrupt. Next, we have amounts owed, contributing 30% of your score. Factors here include total amount of debt and credit utilization. Credit utilization is a measure of how much of the available credit limit a person has is being actively used at the time of reporting. Generally, credit utilization is recommended to be maintained below 30% for this metric. Although if you can pay off any credit card in full prior to the report date, you can improve your score even more. The next category is the length of credit history, which will certainly play a larger impact the earlier you are in your credit building. This looks not only at the age of your oldest credit account, but also the average age of all of your accounts, with the longer being the better. For example, if you're new to credit and go out and get your first credit card, both your average age of accounts and total credit history will begin at zero months. Getting a second card will have any credit history you have. However, both cards will begin to build your credit history. On the other hand, let's say you're 30, have been paying on three different student loan accounts for the past 10 years and have a credit card opened when you started college. Opening a new credit card account would have very little effect on your credit score as your longest credit history would remain at 10 years and the average age of accounts would only drop from 10 years down to eight years. 
There's no exact science to how long your average age of credit should be, but if you're not a prolific opener of new cards or loans, this should just steadily rise over time, and unfortunately, there's no real way to make this go faster. The next category is credit mix, which looks at the number of revolving debts, things like credit cards, which go up and down throughout the month, and installment debts, such as a mortgage, student loan, car loan, and so on. However, this has a very small impact on your score, and I don't see any reason why someone would specifically create a new debt simply to improve your credit mix. The last category that contributes to your FICO score is the number of new inquiries or accounts. You may have heard that opening a new credit card will hurt your credit score, and in some ways that is true. A hard inquiry on your credit score is when a lender requests a credit report from one of the credit bureaus. This will result in a near immediate decrease in your credit score and is considered evidence that you are looking to take on additional debt or open additional lines of credit. However, the overall impact of this is usually quite small, around four to six points. However, opening a new credit account can have other implications, which can be both negative as well as positive for your score. A new account starts off with an age of zero months, and depending on your prior history, can cause a pretty significant reduction in your score by impacting your average age of accounts. However, the credit limit that the new card provides, assuming you're not using it actively to spend more money than you usually would, can actually reduce your relative credit utilization and can actually improve your score. For the most part, your credit score will include the past seven years of history with newer history contributing to a stronger degree and some notable exceptions. On the negative side, late payments, charge-offs, and foreclosures will all negatively impact your credit score for the full seven years. Bankruptcies, depending on the type of bankruptcy filed, can stay on your credit report for up to 10 years. If a delinquency is sent to collections, it can stay on your report for seven years plus 180 days, whether or not you paid the collections amount. Hard inquiries, however, only remain on your credit report for two years and stop affecting your score and credit history entirely after one. On the positive side, information that contributes positively to your credit score can stay there indefinitely payment history, oldest account, and so on, all just continue to get better. However, if an account is paid off in full, for example, if you pay off your student loans, the payment history of that account will ultimately be removed from your report 10 years after the last payment. This is why opening and closing accounts, particularly credit cards, can lower your credit score. You initiate inquiries, lower the average age of accounts, and ultimately lose the increased credit limit and account age after it's closed. It's important to note that there are a lot of free methods to check your credit report on a weekly or monthly basis. There's tools like Credit Karma, Experian, and many bank accounts or credit cards actually have an optional credit check feature. However, these are usually not the most up-to-date information and do use algorithms that are at least slightly different from the traditional FICO score. So they may not be a perfect representation of the score a lender may see, but that doesn't mean they aren't useful. They will rise and fall from most of the same behaviors, but they do have some shortcomings that you should be aware of. One quick thing you can do on Experian is actually utilize Experian Boost, which can add some additional history to your payments Things like utilities, which can only affect your score in a positive way. Ultimately, there's a lot that goes into calculating your credit score, but the overall concepts are quite simple. Consistently make all of your payments on time, limit your credit utilization to below 30%, and the lower the better, and only open new accounts for specific purposes. Do that, and your score should steadily rise. Credit scores are particularly error prone, however, so keep an eye on your score and be sure to challenge any negative factors that you are not responsible for. The end result of all of this is, having a high credit score 
will give lenders confidence in your commitment to pay them back. And because of that, they can offer you favorable interest rates. Here, for example, is the current mortgage rates according to myfico.com. These rates change every day and vary somewhat by lender. So they may not match perfectly if you were to go check them right now, but the idea is the same. The higher your credit score, the lower interest rate you have to pay. And over a 30-year mortgage, the differences can be staggering. Let's look closer at a couple of these for some context. For someone with a credit score over 760, they can qualify today for a 2.821% interest rate with a monthly payment of $1,236 for a $300,000 loan. Over 30 years, they will pay just under $145,000 in interest. That's a lot, but that's pretty standard for mortgages. If instead that home buyer were to have a credit score between 660 and 680, that would increase their rate up to 3.434%. And the payment is then an extra $100 a month. To be honest, it's still a great rate, but this does add an additional $36,000 in interest that would be paid over 30 years. To make it even worse, if that same borrower's credit score were only 620 to 640, now that interest rate jumps all the way up to 4.41%. And don't get me wrong, that's still a nearly record low rate for mortgages. But it also means a monthly payment of over $1,500 and over $240,000 ultimately in interest paid, nearly $100,000 more than if they'd had a score over 760. And this is all for the same loan. The same thing is true actually for credit cards. Although I don't advocate borrowing for items you cannot afford to pay cash for, let alone carrying a balance on a credit card, for those who do, a favorable credit score can lower the interest that they pay. Most credit cards have a range of interest rates that they charge. For example, one of the cards that I have is the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And this can charge users between 17 and 24% interest. Which means that if you're carrying a balance on this card, you could be paying $700 less per year per $10,000 on the card simply by improving your credit score. Even when looking to rent a home, many landlords will check a potential renter's credit history and may not rent to or at least will require additional deposits from tenants with lower scores. So what's your credit score? When did you start building your credit and what steps, if any, are you taking now to raise your score? Let me know in the comments section down below. As always, if you enjoyed the content here or learned something new, please hit the like button for the almighty YouTube algorithm and consider becoming a subscriber. If you ring the bell, you'll get notified each and every time I upload a new video, which I'm bringing each and every week. For more videos on personal finance, debt, investing, and my own family's financial journey, check out our other videos and check back soon for new uploads. I'll see you in the next one.